My name is Sydney Gladman. I'm the Chief Scientific Officer of the Material Innovation Initiative. We are a nonprofit aimed at accelerating the development of sustainable alternatives to animal derived materials. You're probably wondering, what am I doing here in a session on reef restoration? I'm a little bit of an outsider of our crew, uh, but I'm actually from Florida, where a lot of this work is being done on reef restoration. I'm very passionate about our ecosystems and sustainability in our environment. And as a material scientist, um, I think I can potentially help this discussion on how material innovation can aid in reef restoration. So with that, I will allow our other speakers to introduce, introduce themselves. I'll start with Ken uh, on my screen here. Uh, thank you. My name is Ken Niedemeyer and I live in the Florida Keys. Um, I've been dabbling with coral reef restoration for the last 20 years and probably am the the guy that started it in Florida and, and you know, one of the people that led the charge uh, back when it was politically unpopular and couldn't be done, so they said. But anyway, I've uh, started a couple of different companies. I started the Coral Restoration Foundation, uh, ran that for 10 years and then moved on. And now I have, uh, I'm associated with Reef Renewal Foundation. Uh, we have an international company and then also we have a US-based 501c3 that I'll mostly working with right now. And uh, I've, you know, just an, I'm more of an innovator than anything else. You know, once I figure something else, something out that I'm ready to move on to the next challenge. And uh, one of the things we're going to be talking about today is that, you know, the next challenge. So without going into any detail, I'll pass it on to whoever you want to introduce next, Cindy. <laughs> Great. Let's go with Mike. Thanks, uh, Cindy. Uh, my name is Mikey Chevaria. Uh, I'm the president of Reef Renewal USA. Uh, I'm a lawyer by training, uh, and I've entered the redemptive phase of my life where I'm trying to do something good for the planet. Uh, I met Ken uh, 10 years ago and was actually the CEO of, or the uh, chairman of the board for Reef Renewal, Re Re Core Restoration Foundation uh, that Ken had started, and we worked together, and we had more to do. And so basically, I'm running the not-for-profit side. Ken is our technical director. And uh, I spend a lot of time underwater as well as Ken does, but uh, these, uh, these issues are gonna form strategies for where we go uh, on our entire strategy as a company. So this is an important conversation for us. Fantastic, thank you, Mike. So last but not least, Dave, could you please introduce yourself? Sure, I'm Dr. Dave Vaughn and I'm uh, founder of uh, Plant a Million Corals. I spent almost 20 years as aquaculture uh, director at Harbor Branch Oceanographic, which included the development of uh, corals, clams, oysters, fish, and even marine ornamentals for oceans, reefs, and aquariums. Then spent 15 years as the director of, uh, of Moats Tropical Research Lab and Coral Restoration Center. And uh, like Ken, I'd like to think of myself as an innovator from developing technologies for about a dozen other marine species to trying to help and assist uh, coral restoration by producing corals at scale. And uh, like Ken, I've been moving towards all of the, I call them orphan species of corals that need to be cultivated and not just the single uh, staghorn coral that was uh, uh, what most new people get into. And so uh, with uh, the development of uh, uh, nurseries uh, on land, including the hatchery capabilities, we've been innovating new materials to be able to have a wet chain of command of the corals from the land all the way to the field. Fantastic. Thank you so much for that introduction. Um, so for any people who've joined us late, please place your questions in the Q&A. Um, and to further introduce the efforts that are going on in reef restoration, we have two videos that are going to tell you a little bit more um, about what's going on in this space and to pose the problem for this lab session. Hi, I'm Dr. Dave Vaughn from Plant a Million Corals Foundation. With your help, we can plant a million corals in our lifetime. The Plant a Million Corals Foundation's mission is to turn the tides of our oceans in our lifetime. By implementing coral and reef restoration technologies, we can stabilize and reverse the losses of coral reefs globally. Under the leadership of Dr. David E. Vaughn, and by providing research, development, training, and outreach programs in coral restoration technologies, we can have a global impact. 
Using microfragmentation, reskinning, and other new techniques, the Plant a Million Corals Foundation can bring back 100 year old coral communities in a fraction of the time. One of these tools used by Plant a Million Corals is their coral restoration units, turnkey land based nurseries that remove the cost prohibitive nature of an expensive facility and can put these tools in the hands of coastal communities. In as little as 48 hours, these coral restoration units can be set up and functioning as an active land-based nursery, cutting and growing coral to be planted in the field. By transferring the expertise of microfragmentation to an organization or a community, we can exponentially increase the impact of coral restoration on the planet while allowing those most affected by the efforts to take an active role. What will it cost to restore the corals of the world? What will it cost if we don't? With your help, we can plant a million corals. We have one more video to share, and Mike is going to get that set up for us shortly. Reef Renewal USA is a 501c3 public charity committed to pioneering innovative techniques which will expand a more cost-efficient type of coral restoration in the Florida Keys. Our goal is to provide an international model. We stand apart because we grow not only branching corals, but boulder, star, and brain corals as well. Ken Niedemeyer, our technical director, developed the current internationally utilized method for growing and replacing elkhorn and staghorn corals. This method uses trees made of a combination of PVC pipe, fiberglass arms, and monofilament line to suspend the corals mid-water. This technology has successfully facilitated the rapid growth of the corals in nurseries worldwide. But there is a drawback, the biofouling of the PVC, fiberglass, and monofilament. These materials are not only bad for the environment, but increase our costs and maintenance. Our goal is to replace this technique with one that is lower maintenance. Therefore, we have developed the Vertical Nursery, or VERM, a new and innovative technique to suspend the corals using a rope or line as opposed to a tree. The verns reduce the amount of maintenance required and facilitate the growth of the corals in a way superior to that of trees. Coral fragments are cut from existing nursery structures. These fragments, as opposed to being attached with monofilament line to a tree, are instead secured to several different materials to be grown. These materials include bamboo rods or segmented bamboo necklaces. But we still currently use plastic zip ties to connect the coral, which means we are still introducing plastics into the marine environment. The most promising strategy is to suspend the corals directly to a biodegradable rope or line that will last one to two years in the nursery. Once the coral successfully adheres to the bottom naturally, the line will bioerode. We are testing hemp, cotton, and even a monofilament line made out of potato extract. Once the vert is assembled, it is suspended mid-water. The coral fills out, similar to a tree, and is subsequently outplanted onto the reef. When the suspended corals have grown to a sufficient size, the hemp vern is disconnected from the flotation buoy. The hemp rope with the corals is wrapped around existing structures on the bottom. The corals will then naturally attach to the existing reef structure. The current problem is that the endurance of the hemp in the nursery setting is no more than five months. We would like at least 18 months to allow the corals to grow in size before being outplanted. The other technique is using bamboo rods and has great promise. However, the resulting structure coral is rigid and therefore must be secured to the reef in such a fashion to reduce the damage during surge and storms. In summary, Reef Renewal USA aims to outplant more corals to the reef faster, cheaper, and more productively. For this reason, we are always looking for innovations to support these efforts. Um, we have one question from the audience, which is a relatively, I think, probably easy one for some of us to answer, which is that how can people volunteer to work with any of these organizations? Um, so I will let anybody here answer that question on behalf of their organization. 
I'll, I'll go first uh, on behalf of Ken and I. So you know, part of Reef Renewal USA was created because we do believe in the public outreach. Uh, we do have some paid staff, but uh, we have an army of volunteers that uh, can actually go get uh, wet. I heard the session on having the blue mind this morning about people that actually go out and get in the water as divers uh, and help us to actually do the restoration work. Part of what this technique that Ken has developed does, it makes it even easier to get trained up and more effective underwater faster. So Reef Renewal is really focused on growing our volunteer army up and down the Florida Keys. And I'll, I'll just add to that, um, most of my concentration is land-based, so it, it lends itself to uh, people on land being able to uh, volunteer without having to be a swimmer or a diver. And uh, we are hoping to modular eyes and compartmentalize the planting so that the outplanting part is a very small component of the whole life of the production of corals. Great. So would it be um, just to reach out via your websites for more information if people want to volunteer? Perfect. All right. So that's the best place for everyone who was interested in that. I'll also just place the website for the Material Innovation Initiative in the chat if anyone is interested. Again, we're a little bit outside of the scope of this session, um, but we still are doing great work to try to support our planet. <laughs> All right. So Let's start with a little, you know, posing the problem, I think, element here, as was shown in the video. Um, we need a material that can support coral growth um, that does degrade or not produce toxic byproducts in the environment, uh, but does so at a time scale that is controlled, right? So we do have degradable materials that have shown some promise, but they're degrading too quickly. Um, and so there's constantly this issue with people designing materials for degradation that you have to kind of balance the durability that is needed for the application with the time scale of degradation. Um, and one of the important things here is we need to understand the environment for which this is this going on, right? So we're in the marine environment. We're in the Florida Keys, for example, which is warm, lots of exposure to UV. Um, and we need to think about the ecosystem there. So is this a biotic or abiotic you know, environment, aerobic or anaerobic? Um, how are we going to have the material degrade? Um, we also looked at and we saw that fouling of the material can sometimes be an issue as well. Um, so we need materials that will support coral growth, but hopefully not support growth of other organisms that might foul the line or the structure. So hopefully that gives a little bit of food for thought for our lab session here. Um, we had one suggestion from the audience that um, I will pose, which was, have you tried soaking the hemp line with beeswax like candles? So that's anyone. a good question. I actually have a, a bag of beeswax and a bag of soy wax and uh, some hemp, <laughs> and I just haven't gotten around to doing it. I, I think the concern might be that it would become too stiff and you wouldn't be able to open the rope up and, and stick the coral in there once it's been soaked. But, you know, you haven't, we haven't tried it yet. So, you know, and beeswax is fairly soft. So we're going to, we're going to give it a try, try to, you know, and I think obviously if, if that would work, that would extend the life of the hemp rope by quite a bit because the beeswax would, would prevent it from rotting so fast. I mean, we've, we've even had different hemp ropes, uh, decompose at different rates. And so, it, you know, one hemp rope is not the same as the next. Um, and, you know, again, I don't think hemp is going to be our solution. I think there's other um, ropes out there. We're trying cotton right now, which has actually done a lot better than I thought. But what we've been trying to do is find a, a bioplastic rope um, that would, you know, naturally decompose over a period of a couple of years. And we've, you know, we've had no luck. Uh, enticing a bioplastics manufacturer to to even look into that. I mean, I, I guess it's like who want to build a rope that's only going to last two or three years. But I think there's a global um, market for, for something like this. This would change the way branching corals are are grown and, and outplanted throughout the world. I mean, this would be an, an amazing game changer if we could come up with the right material. So we're looking at, uh, you know, we're looking at the natural stuff, but we're also looking at, at um, you know, can we get a bioplastic rope that would serve the purpose? And I, I think it can be done, but we haven't gotten anywhere on that yet. I agree with you, Ken. Um, as somebody who came from this plastic space as an immaterial scientist, um, 
The advantage of bioplastics is that they can be formed into lots of different shapes and structures. And those shapes and structures themselves can control the biodegradation rate, um, right? You know, how thick the filaments in the rope are, um, you know, how much surface area is exposed at a given time. And then things like the internal structure of the polymer, the crystallinity, um, do you have any void structures, things like that, that can change how rapidly things will move um, in the degradation path. So I think there is some fundamental science that will probably need to be done, a little bit of you know, testing in R&D, which you guys are already doing in the field. Um, but I imagine some small scale lab experiments could also be done to kind of speed up those tests to see um, what materials are gonna be best suited um, for that application. So I'd like to uh, actually frame this whole conversation and just step back a little bit yeah, absolutely. because there's always going to be people that are caught up on all the other issues like, you know, the climate change and disease and all these kind of things. And, and we're working on all that. I mean, we're very aware of, of you know, the climate change where, you know, a lot of people uh, are convinced that this is a waste of time and that, uh, you know, they're all going to die anyway. So there's, you know, that's not the discussion for today, but I just want to let everybody know that look, we're we're paying close attention to that. We're developing strains of corals that we think are disease resistant, heat resistant, uh, you know, corals for the 21st century. So there's a whole, you know, we're involved in that. There's a whole group of people involved in that. So we're not operating in the dark, but we're we're looking beyond that. And and we, you know, the problem right now is we can grow so much coral, but we can't planted on the reef fast enough. And whether it's Dave doing microfrags or us doing these branching corals or any of the other corals, we just can't get, that's the bottleneck. And so we're trying to break through that bottleneck with this idea, at least for the branching corals with growing them on these vertical ropes. And if we could do that, I mean, you could literally drop the rope off the side of a boat with a maybe a biodegradable float and a biodegradable rope and a, you know, a, a block of, you know, dead coral <laughs> and, and you can just leave it there and it would eventually, something would fail and it'd fall onto the bottom and you'd plant a, a reef. You know, you're thinking on the size of the Australian, you know, the Great Barrier Reef, you know, so we've got to think, we've got to get away from, you know, an army of divers planting individual corals and think of, you know, something bigger and better than that. So that's kind of one of the things that's prompting our uh, search for this biodegradable rope. So with that, I'll back off and <laughs> let somebody else chat. Yeah, I'd like to just mention that uh, um, I had a different background than a lot of people in coral biology or ecology or coral disease is that I, I worked for almost 30 years on other scale up of marine organisms for the uh, aqu large scale aquaculture. And so um, I was always used to a land-based hatchery, a land-based nursery, then a field-based nursery and a grow out. And so I took the early road of uh, looking at all those orphan corals, the other 28 species of some of the massive corals to see if we could grow them as well and maybe easier on land. And we literally stumbled upon a way to cut them into small pieces so that on land that we were making hundreds of fragments and by cutting them small it triggers a fast growth response for healing and they grow for the first next six months to a year at about 20 times the speed so not only can we produce large numbers they grow to size in in um at record speed and we take the 20 to 100 pieces and we plant them close together they grow fast to touch each other and they re-recognize each other as themselves and refuse into a coral head that, for instance, could be the size of a mature coral head that would spawn in 25 years, but will spawn now in five years. So we've been looking at ways to scale up the land-based facility in order to supply either people in field nurseries or people who wanna just do the planting of a size of many more of the species that can be done. And one of the ways that that can be done is, is looking at the other methods made to scale up aquaculture for clams and oysters and fish. And I hate to tell you, but they wouldn't be an advancement of aquaculture of marine species if it wasn't for plastic pipe and fiberglass tanks. That's what the big evolution in, in marine aquaculture happened. But they're not one use disposables. They're meant to be left and used over and over again for years. And so I think 
we're not necessarily looking for different materials on land uh, for a one-use deployment, but for materials that will last longer. And if we are pushing something out as deployment, we've been looking at alternatives to the typical Portland cement, concrete, that type of thing, as a much more future uh, position. We're actually looking to plant these things in modules. So we're planting 25 uh, corals at a time so that it's not the one minute to plant the coral, it's the six to nine months to grow it that needs to be done at scale and, and improved. And uh, so we're, we're looking at ways to make these typical little cement or, or um, ceramic plugs that we grow the coral on as the size of the little dot. And in a very short period of time, that coral grows to a three-year-old size in a few months, and that can be planted. But instead of drilling and utilizing the 50% of the dead coral heads to reskin a new one uh, by drilling holes, we're looking to make those holes into a, a nice, more natural material that can be done on land. And these fuse together as a 25 or maybe even a 50 year old coral head on land. And then it only take one minute to plant one of these. But we've got to have a material that not just is entombed in the reef, such as uh, Portland cement, but something a little more natural of a calcium carbonate substrate that maybe didn't take as much carbon dioxide to, you know, in order to produce. So we're looking at some other materials now uh, that are, are more naturally looking like a calcium carbonate skeleton of a reef. And we're looking at ways to uh, maybe plant them out. One of the things I might suggest to Ken is that uh, I had been familiar with a, a bioplastic material back in my oyster days that was made from potato starch and had a lifespan of one to two years. And it was made into the typical mesh bag for oysters. So you would just plant the oysters and with one or two years that mesh would dissolve, leaving the oyster attached. I think this is a way that we could maybe plant something like our corals in the mesh and plant that mesh out, maybe flexibly over a dead coral head and know that that plastic, bioplastic is going to dissolve over a short period of time. That may be a good way to do uh, tag homes. We're actually uh, testing them, some of that out right now, Dave, from that exact same manufacturer. It's a, basically a, looks like a 200 pound monofilament. That's what they have right now. Um, you know, it could be adapted to be used. Uh, you know, we're, we're about three or four months, three months into a trial right now. We'll see how it goes. Excellent. All right, so we do have a few more questions in the chat. Um, one is, are there any risks in introducing coral, especially by dropping them off in the ocean? Um, would they need to only be placed in areas where coral is damaged or are there any concerns associated with that? You wanna take that, Ken, or should I? Sure, well, I mean, we're putting corals back where they used to be and, you know, different corals have preferred habitats and we're very aware of where they used to be and where they prefer to live. And so we're putting, you know, the right coral species in the right habitats. Um, and it's not willy nilly. We are, we're very precise about where we put them. Um, you know, this idea of, uh, you know, that I mentioned earlier of just dropping these things over the side, you know, you'd be putting the, the corals that you need and want in the right areas. You know, it would be strategic. It would be well thought out. But no, I don't think there's a, a, a danger. I mean, the only danger is to we might actually have some corals come back. That's not it shouldn't be too bad. <laughs> And the problem is right now, especially places like the Florida Keys, there's almost no corals anyway. So what are you going to da damage, you know, <laughs> you know, a dead reef? Yeah, Ken's right. Is that uh, we, I don't think we could ever get to the point where we have too many corals. Uh, we've gone from, you know, a good reef being 50, 60 percent hard coral to now in places, you know, two to seven percent, even in a good reef. So uh, with the micro fragmentation, there's no lack of existing dead coral heads. And, and we plant, for instance, a knobby brain coral on a dead knobby brain coral squirrel. And we literally bring that 100 year old coral head back to life by putting new live tissue on that same coral head. But there's no reason in the future that if we ever filled our reefs back to where they were, that we couldn't make reefs where there never even was reefs before. Because most of the limitation of the success of a coral is going from the sexual swimming stage of a larvae that has to survive on the bottom. 
if we could put a substrate, natural substrate down that could grow a coral in an area that it would never have landed, there's no reason that bare bottom couldn't be a wonderful productive ecosystem. Thank you for answering that question. So we actually have a few requests to join in on the panel. Um, I'm gonna see if anyone still wants to join us because I think they're a little old. <clears throat> I am here. here we go. Hi, Tom. Hey. Hi, guys. Hey, Tom. I, uh, I come from material science background as well and, and nearly went to uh, school for oceanography and marine biology. So, But I've been uh, moved off to the manufacturing space. I've been following the uh, conversation, trying to think of solutions at different angles. I don't have any specific questions. I think like um, the, the, the power of bringing a community of uh, like-minded people together first and foremost is probably the uh the accelerant for change and giving people awareness it's like there's there's a lot going on in, in our lives and uh just i wasn't aware of what's been going on in the space at all so the, this has been eye-opening for me the question comes to mind for me is how do we um how do we uh, amplify the the message to give you guys access to more resources and what are the uh what are the challenges and opportunities from a resource standpoint um other than the technical challenges which have taken up a lot of the conversation uh coming at it from a uh to scale scale this effort up i'm sure that's half of the challenge for you guys yeah i, I was telling uh sydney earlier i had approached several different bioplastics company even just regular plastics company <clears throat> with this idea of a biodegradable rope and nobody would respond i, I mean they just like I, I didn't even get a peep out of them. So, you know, I'm just not a big enough voice. And I think they just like, oh, what, a, you know, it's another nutcase. Uh, but but the, the plastic, you know, I mean, it, it's you, know, you look at bioplastics now and, and most of them are only biodegradable in a in commercial composting unit. This is not going to be a commercial composting. This is this is different. But but there are additives you can put in plastics that will cause them to degrade at a specified rate of time. And, you know, I just think that we could find I mean, I don't think it's a mystery on what to do. It's just finding somebody that's going to commit to being a part of helping us do it. I am an advisor for a company that's doing um, a compostable um, single use, well, reusable compostable multi-use bags for groceries. You know, I'm trying to get the plastic bags out of the produce section and things like that. And they have a, um, a newly developed compostable material that they're using. Um, maybe you guys, I, I don't have it the information on hand, but I could definitely uh, get you that information. And this um, is new and it's it's proven compostable and, and they're, they've done a lot of testing with a university, I think it with Stanford. Um, and it may be a new line of materials that's, that's come out. They, they just became aware of it this past year. And um, maybe a, a good opportunity to, to explore that material because if it's they're doing in fibers for these bags, certainly, um, you know, scaling up this fiber size to, to rope size might be possible. Absolutely, absolutely. Bringit.org um, is the website. If, uh, if you lose track of me somehow. <laughs> what was it called? Thank you. Bringit.org. Okay. Bringit.org. I'll put you. it in the chat. Yeah, yeah, if you put it in the chat, that would be great. We can all yeah. take, check it out later. Yeah. Uh, thank you thank so much. You, Tom. Sure thing. One of the uh, one of the ideas that we formed this session several months ago was, wouldn't it be great if we could actually form kind of a an action committee that would uh, survive the session, uh, and maybe even report back next year at the Sea Change Sessions H two O twenty twenty two that we could actually work offline, as you said, a community time of materials engineers and coral work, uh, reef restoration practitioners to find this solution and actually come back and give a report next year on it with hopefully a solution that might work. So I'll, I'll, I'll invite a call to action about anybody who would like to continue on this that we could even informally create it to continue the conversation and to bring resources to the table to, so, to solve a problem in an area where you guys have the expertise on the material side. I think that's a great idea. I'm on board. <laughs> Loop me in. I'm here. Yeah. All right. Fantastic. Um, I just had one note after hearing Dave speak a little bit more about the structures that he's working on is that I think 3D printing could be a pretty interesting approach for everyone to think about. I know it's often just thought of as a buzzword and to make cute stuff, but 
actually did my PhD in 3D printing. And I think that you can do a lot with being able to control both the formulation and the structure um, to really aid in how these corals are going to react to their growth environment. So for ceramics, you can print them, you know, in, in very high surface area, lattice structures, you know, porous structures that might resemble like the brain coral, for example. Um, and while we have plenty of dead coral right now to use as our, um, as our structure, maybe someday we're going to want to be able to make it ourselves and not just have to harvest the dead coral. So that's just one idea. You can also print the bioplastics as well into these interesting structures that might be able to better control that degradation process and the flexibility and properties that Ken and Mike really need to be able to have it conform to the reef when you're in the outplanting stage. So that was just one suggestion. I think that's a good suggestion. And I think Michael's suggestion is great as well, that uh, I'm really anxious to see the innovations just over the next year or so, uh, because uh, when Ken and I first started, we, we were literally working with uh, cement blocks and, and uh, things have changed in the past 10 to 15 years incredibly. And I expect that to happen in the next one to five years as well. So I think a working group would be great. Uh, 3D printing, I think, is another one. I think we have to look at the materials that it is used Absolutely. in it. Mm -hmm. if, uh, if we're going to leave this um, in the ocean, yep. we don't want it to eventually become something that was so environmentally destructive that it took a, a ton agree. of uh, CO2 to produce. Completely agree. Yep. So I, I'm on board. But if you want to learn more, my, my old research lab, we printed a lot of ceramics of different formulations, um, and we'd be, I'd be happy to talk more about that. Um, all right, we do have actually one more person who'd like to join and a couple of questions. So first, I'll check and see if Carl Goodsell um, is still around and wants to join us. So I'm going to let him in. So uh -huh. one of the things I also, uh, I mean, the, the rope is certainly a pressing one for us, but, a, you know, an adhesive because uh, even if you, uh, like Dave, if you start creating those modules and planting them, you have to glue them down somehow. And that's actually more work than anything else. And so we need a better cement that's eco-friendly. So anyway, Carl, welcome. <laughs> Hi, Carl. Real quick, Thanks, I have a great guys. idea for your adhesive. Um, there's okay, been a great. lot of work in um, biomimicry of muscle adhesives, um, like yeah. mollusks. Um, so that adhesive is really good at binding underwater, as you can imagine, as how that's how muscles and um, other more organisms attach themselves. Um, and so people have been able to, you know, synthesize these materials that are quite similar, that are used as tissue adhesives, like in the body. That's primarily where people have been looking at applications, but mm -hmm. I can see it being quite interesting and useful in the marine mm -hmm. environment where it was naturally uh, occurring anyway. So that's a little side note. But we did let Carl in and I want to give him a chance to um, you know, participate here in our session. So welcome, Carl. Thank you. Really interesting conversations. And I'll apologize in advance for my fuzziness. It's uh, 4.44 in the morning here and I'm fading <laughs> hard. <laughs> um, so I run a marine conservation charity called Positive Change for Marine Life. And at the moment we work in, well, we're developing blue carbon projects in Australia, but uh, we also have teams in India and the Solomon Islands and work on waste to wealth projects, fisheries management programs, and really trying to build resilience in these coastal communities to develop long-term alternatives that um, prioritise conservation over um, destruction of marine ecosystems. And we do that through creating alternative economies. I've always been interested in coral restoration. Um, the river that is just near our farm actually feeds into the Great Barrier Reef up here in Queensland. So definitely a huge challenge that we're facing in Australia. And I'm wondering whether you guys have worked in developing nations and what it would look like to, um, to be able to grow that work and sustain it because we definitely have a huge need in Kerala in India where fisheries have collapsed and coral reefs are just completely degraded. Uh, and also in the Solomons and we have huge teams and great partnerships that I think could definitely see that work through. Uh, if there are opportunities there. So the I other hat the I wear is with a, an international brand mm -hmm. of reef renewal. And uh, we've worked mostly in the Caribbean, but we've actually set up a, or helped set up a nursery and a restoration program in Cairns, Australia. So, but we have, you know, just like Dave is probably going to say, we've worked in Jamaica and some of these third world countries where resources are tight and you have to come up with a, 
creative ways to make it happen and get it funded. And it's it's a real challenge. I mean, the need is there, the desire is there, but the funding is not. <laughs> Dave, I think you were jumping. Ken, Ken's absolutely right in that uh, both of us uh, kind of had a career change to try to spread this technology around, especially to countries and island nations that need it. And we've been doing our best to do that in the Caribbean and, and now also looking at other places. And in order to do that, we literally have to do this in three stages. One, it's got to be at scale in the number. And then second, it's got to be at scale of low cost. And then third, it's got to be uh, something that is so low in labor or maintenance that it is easy to do and fast. If we can do those three things with both a process, a new material, a new strategy of modular moving of corals and, and getting them planted, we can make a real difference. And the biggest difference, I think, should be in some of those developing countries and island nations. Thank you. Great, thanks, guys. Um, it just, just roughly, how much kind of funding would you all need to to make this a reality and to kind of work on that technology to develop this sort of solution? That's a great question, and one of the things that you probably saw in the very beginning is everybody thought that the land-based nursery, like the ones I built in the large oceanographic institutes, which cost a million dollars, was too high cost and high technology to do anywhere else. So we're trying to do something at the stage of around $100,000 that can have the production of corals as as little as about $2 a coral. And if we can do that with raising funds from other sources, that is raising funds from larger foundations who will pay that amount to do the training and send the equipment to somebody who can't afford it at all. Yeah, so it, it becomes the, for us the it's a question of scale. Uh, we we get a lot of people that uh, you know they approach us. Can you help us do a coral restoration project in our our country? And a lot of times they're small scale things. You know they 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 don't have a great big vision. They don't have a great big budget. And so sometimes these projects are ten to twenty thousand dollars over a two or three year period. And you you get quite a few corals out planted, and it, it all is great. But you know, I'm looking at, you know, how do we do this to really make a difference, not just some little boutique house reef type thing, but how do we do it on a really large scale where we change the environment, where we actually create habitat for fish, where we, um, you know, rebuild a reef. And uh, it's expensive. It, it just, it takes, it's more manpower. That's what we're trying to get into, where it's more manpower and local manpower. And, you know, the idea is let's get away from the, the high cost doodads and get into a low cost system that works and uh, you know we can provide training and all that but it still requires somebody on the ground willing to do the work and I think you know my original foray into all of this was you know we're never gonna have enough money to hire marine biologists to do it you don't need marine biologists to do it Dave's said it lots of times and I copy it it, it doesn't take a rocket science to do this but it does take a, a, a willing group of people that want to do it. And I looked at the recreational dive community, at least for the field work part of it. It's like, these guys are dying to do something meaningful. And it's just a matter of how do you train them? How do you engage them? How do you guide them? Um, and we did that a lot when I was with Coral Restoration Foundation. We're trying to do it now in a slightly different way. But I, I still think that's part of the solution is to engage volunteers uh, that want to make a difference. And Carl, to take it offline, the other thing is in developing nations is actually reskilling. Uh, especially if you're dealing with the fishermen, you described uh, India that uh, Ken and I were in Jamaica many years ago, where you've got to convince the fishermen that it's better to go out and grow coral than it is to kill parrotfish. And so, and that's if, if they're they got to have the parrotfish to eat, it's a really hard sell. So you have to have almost a whole program to reskill them about why either coral restoration. Ecotourism around coral restoration might be the new revenue source that would be able to let them change careers. But yeah, they've they've overfished it, uh, and then the pollution as well. So I'd be happy to. I put my uh, our website in the uh, chat. If you want to contact me, I'll be happy to uh, talk to you further about that. Yeah, that'd be great. Thanks everyone. It's really exciting, and I'll keep the conversation going. I know Michael that uh, in India, all fishermen we've spoken to are desperate for an alternative career. They're spending more money on diesel. And a lot of them are dying at sea at the moment because they're having to go 
so far out for so long. So I think there's a huge potential in a lot of these places for alternatives, and that's what we're exploring too. Keep up the great work. Thanks so much. Thanks so much, Thank Carl. You, Carl. Cheers. And I, if I can take this opportunity to say that uh, uh, Ken and I and a number of other coral restoration people from around the world, 72 authors put together a 600-page book that is 11 chapters on how this is done, as also 11 case studies from around the world with countries that showed how it worked in their area. And I'll put that uh, website of how to how to get that uh, book on there. And by the way, that picture on the top, from one little coral on the top to a whole living reef on the bottom is the same location after 10 years of, of restoration by a fisherman group called Fragments of Hope in, in Belize that's successfully done that. Fantastic. Yeah, so thank you. If Dave, you could put that in the chat for us so we can take a look later. Um, we do have a couple of questions in the chat. I'm going to combine a couple of them together, or comments, um, actually, more suggestions. So Stevie um, and Nicola um, both have suggestions for potential biodegradable products to explore. One is that Stevie mentioned that there is a brewery in Florida making their beer holders out of wheat and barley. And Nicola asked if um, kelp or other natural materials um, might be a good idea as they would also promote beneficial marine life um, in the reef. And so they both put those suggestions out there and I wanted to see if anybody here had any comments about this. Well, it, 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 re it requires somebody taking either kelp or beer containers, whatever the product is being used and turning it into a, a, a rope or a strand. And that's that's the, the problem we run into is finding somebody interest, interested in doing that. And I think that sometimes people just blow us off. It's like, oh, it's just another kook, like I said earlier. You know, it's a small scale thing, but this could be a worldwide market. This could be a huge market. This would be used everywhere. This would be the go-to way to grow and outplant uh, branching corals. Now, that's granted, that's not all the corals that are net needed, but a lot of times they're the ones that are needed the most. They're the ones that have died and and need to be replaced first. And so, it is a it's a huge market potentially. And so I, you know, I, I keep that in mind. It's like, look, you know, we, I think we'll find some people, somebody, some product is going to become available and we'll be able to do our international network, start pushing this out there. And, it, you know, a lot of people, they have to see it before they're going to believe it. There's the early adopters and then there's the rest. And I think we have some early adopters. We just have to have a product uh, to show and, uh, and do it. And we're, we're working on it. Well, uh, for everyone here on the panel, I have a few companies in mind that are using kelp, for example, and also using lots of different bioplastics that I think would be very interested in this um, since the mission is aligned, right? Everyone's trying to work to make more sustainable materials that are going to save our planet, right? And so if they can also support direct applications that are saving ecosystems, I think that it would really be a great partnership. So I will offline give, give you guys some of that information and hopefully we'll come to a solution soon. <laughs> So another good product that would be super useful would be a, a well-designed, affordable uh, cable tie made out of a bioplastic. We've gotten some cable ties made out of bioplastics and some printed on a 3D printer that were made with a bioplastic, but they're they're clunky. They're they're just not up to the quality of a of a traditional nylon cable tie. But uh, boy, if you could find something like that, or if we could create something like that, another huge market that changes a lot of things. That makes bamboo more useful. And uh, you know, there's lots of bamboo out there, but how do you attach a coral to a bamboo? We've been using cable ties. If we could use a biodegradable cable tie, you know, we're like, wow, that changes yeah. things. Yeah, that's great. Um, I definitely think there are some out there. I think it could be done. Um, so I'm excited. Um, we can talk offline. <laughs> um, yeah, looking forward to it. <laughs> yeah, so I think I haven't seen any new questions come up in the chat. Um, is there anything that Ken, Dave, or Mike, you wanted to make sure you mentioned here before we close out the session? Yeah, I, I wanted to just say that, uh, you know, uh, what Ken's group is doing, what I've been doing, are not competitors. We're not exclusive. We're actually uh, just working on the same big giant cause. And there's many ways to do that cause. And I'm sure there's going to be new people coming up with some new ideas, hopefully younger people in the future to carry this on. 
And so um, my wife used to say, there's as many ways to grow a clam as there are clam farmers. But I'd like to change that and say, there's many ways to plant a coral as there are <laughs> coral farmers. So we all need to learn of what works and we all need to try and make it, keep making it better because to get to scale is what we have to do uh, very quickly. On the land-based system, I found all the fiberglass squared rectangular tanks were made for fish culture. They're not made for corals whatsoever. So I'm redesigning some new materials, some new shapes, for specifically for corals. And I think if we can get the things like Ken was talking about, you know, a, a type of biodegradable rope for corals, a way to biodegradable, you know, zip tie or electric tie, uh, tie wrap, uh, you know, that degrades. All those kinds of things I think are really good. I know I've been looking for the marine technology industry for underwater exploration for ways to do monitoring quicker, but we need to look at materials, I think, material innovation and uh, alternate material sources that can do this cost effectively. Absolutely. Um, real quickly, just wanted to throw out there, I know we talked about calcium carbonate, we talked about plastics, and we kind of had them in separate buckets, but I could see composites being really interesting here, where you fill the plastic with calcium carbonate, which is already a very common filler for plastics. It's used for a variety of just, you know, yeah. purposes. Um, where you might, you know, get some really interesting properties. So that's another thing to think about. Um, Sydney, right, well, while we, uh, yeah, we'll wait for him to get in. <laughs> when she comes back, you know, when I, when I I posted my email and Ken did as well in the uh, uh, in the um, actually I, I did it wrong. I got to redo it uh, in the chat because um, anybody that has an interest in this conversation going forward, I'd be happy to be the custodian of that information. We can do it by Zoom. That's the beauty of what we're doing there. Sydney, if you could stay on uh, with us in, in in that session and Absolutely. give us some guidance and maybe bring some more partners to the table. Uh, Absolutely. I have a conversation to continue. So let me uh, redo my email in the, I put my partial uh, website in there, but email in there. I'll collect okay. anybody, send me an email on it and I'll contact Sydney uh, and Dave and Ken to see if there's a worthwhile, maybe a monthly conversation as a follow-up sure. and uh, with some commitments for action. Absolutely. So it looks like we lost MJ, but maybe she'll reach out separately if she has something yeah. interesting going on there. Uh, we also had Jamie White Wicked. I'm not sure how to pronounce it. Uh, question: The Get Involved page of Reef Renewal just says coming soon. Is there someone specific? I think <laughs> Mike would be, um, yep. as he just yes. mentioned. He, you can reach out to him by his email directly. In the meantime, uh, yeah, we're, right, we're, so we're doing a, a we're doing a refresh on our website where we're going to have links to directly to dive shops and to people to be able to uh, schedule trips. So that's uh, coming attraction. So I'm typing my email, please contact me and I'll get you directed to the right spot. Great. All right. So we've got a little less than 10 minutes left in this session. Um, Dave, did you I, have I would anything? actually. Oh, sorry, Ken. <laughs> well, I, I just want to say that one of the, you know, we, we, and I kind of mentioned it earlier, but you know, one of the things we fight with, fight with one, one of our challenges, not just in materials, not just manpower, is this whole idea that we can do it or we can't do it. You know, the there's there's a huge um, group of people and it's, it, you know, most people think the Great Barrier Reef is dead already. Uh, the media, you know, certainly likes to play down, you know, play up the bad news. And so the people have kind of given up on coral reefs and they they're convinced that there's nothing we can do and yada, yada. And, and and then they say, well, you need to stop trying to do that and you need to get out there and fight, you know, emissions and all this. And it's like, you know, look, this is, you know, I can't do everything. This is what I do and this is what I'm, I'm focused on. But I, I think that, you know, there is a lot of hope. There is a lot of promise that we can make headway. Uh, there's selective breeding programs taking place now to develop, you know, and enhance, you know, favorable characteristics among corals. I mean, so much has happened in the last five or 10 years and yet people, they just believe what they see on the media. And, and if I could just leave a parting thought is that, you know, we, I, I do think we can do this. We can make some headway. It, it doesn't mean that we should, it doesn't give us license to continue life as normal. We shouldn't be doing that. But there is hope. And if you, if you don't have hope, then you're not going to invest in this. You're not going to think this is even worth doing. And uh, so I have a lot of hope. And I used to say, it, I, I'm selling hope and I'm buying time. If I can sell enough hope and give people enough hope, we can buy more time. Can we buy enough time? I, I don't know. You know, I, I, I think we can. 
but it's certainly worth trying. We can't sit on our butts and just say it's all over with because there still are some fantastic reefs out there. There's still beautiful places in the Florida Keys that just defy all logic. So we need to keep fighting for this or it's just going to go away. So that's my two cents. I'll get off my soapbox and I think Dave was going to say something. <laughs> yeah, I I just like to say that uh, you know, both Ken and I started in the world of marine life collection, ornamentals and food uh, species of fish that that we could sell and have a business plan. And then we started growing corals for the betterment of the ocean. So it's not a good business plan out there uh, to be able to raise funds. So we've all been relying on donations and some governments are starting to and some bigger foundations are starting to. But I think one of the biggest potentials is using coral restoration experience as an educational attraction. That is, we, we make coral restoration available for people, not just on a weekend to plant a coral, but maybe as a whole week experience, an eco discovery uh, for a whole family or at a resort or at a, at a uh, just a public attraction. And those kinds of numbers of, of input of dollars can keep a coral restoration not only educated to thousands of people, but hopefully funded and supported for their operational costs and maintenance costs. That's a fantastic idea. I would definitely want to participate in an event like that. <laughs> Great. All right. Well, um, we're coming to a close Very here. Good. Um, and, and, you know, and not seeing many more um, questions. If you didn't have, if you have a question, make sure it's in the Q and A because the chat is a little bit busy. Um, and yeah, I mean, this has been a fantastic session. I think there's a lot of food for thought. Um, and I think one takeaway that I see is that we really need to collaborate um, in order to solve this problem. We can't be siphoned off doing um, work by ourselves. We need to reach out to the resources of others to get stuff done. Um, you know, we have two organizations here that like-minded goals. Like they said, they're not competing. They're trying to, you know, work to solve this problem. Um, and so I would say that, you know, please follow up with these organizations if you are interested in getting involved. Um, and hopefully we can make a change and maybe next year we'll have a lot to report back on um, in terms of the progress that's been made since this session. Go ahead. That'd be great. All right. So, Any other Cindy, <laughs> so Cindy, one of the other things is that um, we were told that this session closes at two, uh, at 205 or 305 oh, for anybody 305. else coming in coming out in however we can stay on if you, and so if there's anybody who wants to continue the conversation uh, i've got nowhere else to be but i do want to throw a commercial shout out i'm actually in burlington vermont at hula so my background uh, i'm up here uh, what a facility and what a great job they've done throwing this uh, and making it available so i happen to be virtual with you all but i'm live here in burlington so great job to the uh, Hula team and to Russ and to Sea Change Sessions H2O. Great. So that means if you're you are also live, you can go find Mike and you know meet up with him over there. <laughs> <clears throat> but yes, like you so mentioned, we're still on if anybody is here, but you we will close new entries to the session here in about five I, minutes. I, I'm gonna put someone on the spot. <laughs> All right. So we happen to have a friend who I did not expect to be here online, who's a chemist who runs a sunscreen company called Stream to Sea. And <laughs> I was just really curious that I saw her on the lineup. Autumn, are you with us? Can you join us? I would like to hear your thoughts. Kent, uh, Autumn's been diving with us in not only Florida, but in Cuba and uh, doing the reefs. She's a great environmentalist uh, and doing great products that are reef safe. Autumn, are you out there? Autumn, if you're here, you can request to join and I can let you in. We'd love to chat to see your see your face. <laughs> she just said, "I'm here." She said, "I'm here." She's probably cringing and cursing you, Mike. <laughs> oh, I can, oh, Come on, Alan. Yeah, she she's coming in. Let her in. Yep. There we Cuba go. girl. Oh, hey, guys. <laughs> Let's see. I don't know how to turn my camera on, which is probably good because I didn't do my hair. The bottom. <laughs> no, it's it's blocked out. Ah, oh, lucky day. Well, it's wonderful <laughs> to see your face, Mike, and. Uh, the rest of you as well. Hi, Ken. Hi, David. All right. So, well, Autumn, hi, any Autumn. thoughts? 
Any thoughts as a chemist on this conversation? We haven't talked about this, uh, but it's kind of what we're working on. And uh, again, Autumn's done a great job as a chemist formulating reese-based sunscreen. And this was not planned. I did not expect to see Autumn. We hadn't talked about her being here, but I saw her on the list. So any thoughts for us on uh, innovation and technology, Autumn? Gosh, I, you're with the experts. I mean, Mike, I'm a little embarrassed to say that I missed the last 30 seconds before I heard my name jump on there. We're in production <laughs> back here. So I'm not 100% on the ball. But, uh, yeah, I can't wait to come see what you're doing with, uh, with the new nursery down there. Yeah, it's very exciting. Yeah. Next time I'm in Florida, I'm going to have to check it out. <laughs> Um, any, well, I do have a couple any, of additional thoughts for the group since we have a few more minutes. Um, one thanks, is just, Autumn. Good you know, to see you. Thanks, uh, you Autumn. <laughs> thanks so much. Sorry, I couldn't contribute more there. <laughs> uh, right. So once, I think I mentioned this briefly, but I just wanted to throw it out there again, is that I always think that it's beneficial to look to adjacent industries and, um, you know, the innovations that have been taken place there. So, for example, the biomedical, you know, um, community has been trying to tackle how to controllably degrade things in the body for a very long time. And yes, it's a very different environment than the marine environment. Um, but I think some of the principles and the research that has gone into that space, because as you can imagine, that's a very well-funded space um, from an academic standpoint, could carry over, right? And so some of these materials that people are looking at for implants or for drug delivery, um, you know, they are really are tailoring them to many different, um, you know, degradability timelines, right? Sometimes you want it fast, but sometimes for something like bone repair, you really want it to be more slow to incorporate yeah. natural bone. Um, so I just, as a suggestion to the group, you know, that potentially could be a place to look um, for some of these materials and see if anybody could, you know, give you some samples to try for some of these, uh, this work. That's a great suggestion. And uh, people may know me from one of my earlier uh, videos with AARP, I made a suggestion almost 10 years ago that the, the section of microfragmentation that causes a slow growing coral to all of a sudden grow very fast and then touch each other and then stop is very similar to what we could learn in biomedical processes. And a few people from uh, Texas uh, looked into the enzymes and the coordinating things that are making there. And there are some things that I think are gonna help in the biomedical world. And as yes, you said, calcium carbonate production, very similar to bone, is gonna be something that you know the coral does and has been doing for millions of years. So maybe that's something that also can have that. And we may learn of some of the mater new materials that are innovatively made from, from those biomedical ones who, who have good dollar incentives to do so that we can take back into the coral world and have for the help of restoration processes. Absolutely, yeah. So the, the you know osteogrowth world is huge, and I see a lot of parallels. I think it could be really interesting. You know, some of the simplest things have been like oxidized titanium surfaces um, that support bone growth for like hip implants. You know, some of these things might be you know things to you know titanium's a little expensive. Maybe that's not our best material choice for for cheap and scalable but look to the learnings and see what we can find, right? I think it's it's yeah. worthwhile. Um, Good point. Good yeah. point. Other industries, of course, too, you know, packaging is currently having a big, big run on trying to find biodegradable materials. Again, they're preferring, I think, shorter time frames um, than what you guys are looking for. But that's actually a funny thing. It's they're, they're having the challenge of their materials degrading too slowly, right? So it's almost <laughs> like their challenge is your solution, right? Um, yeah. In that way, again, I think some cross-pollination could be useful. And then finally, the space that I primarily live in is the textile space. As we know, textiles are contributing to a lot of the microplastic pollution in our oceans. Um, and they are basically monofilaments, right? A lot of these textiles, polyester like t-shirts, are essentially the same thing as a monofilament, but woven or knit together. Um, and so the solutions that are being put forward to find you know, more biodegradable textiles also could apply in this space, particularly for the um, for the ropes and lines, because it's pretty much exactly the same material um, that you're trying to make. So just some and other besides, out of the box thoughts. <laughs> and besides yeah. new innovative materials, uh, I think we need new ways of material handling. Yes. That is the wet chain from handling, you know, corals too many times from a, a boat to a diver back to a boat, 
to an igloo cooler, to a bucket. And uh, on land, it's the same thing. If we, if we can lower the material handling by learning from people who do that for a living of, of shipping a box or shipping a container, shipping a, you know, some sort of compartmentalized piece of it and only touching it maybe a few times instead of too many times. Yeah, some logistics. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, we are over on the time. I do have to run in three minutes, um, but we can continue to chat. Um, people, we are still several people in here. So <laughs> so does anybody, if anyone has any questions or any other thoughts to talk about in the last few minutes, happy to do so. And if you want to follow up, uh, emails are in the uh, chat and uh, follow up and uh, we will uh, commit to organizing a few further conversation. Absolutely. I just noticed it was in the chat that Nicola also had an interesting comment that the winter session of Sea Change had a big focus on biomaterials, things like snowboard companies and clothing companies that are already developed and on the market at scale. So perhaps connecting the summer session of Sea Change with the winter session folks, the people who spoke and the people who attended, would make some for some good connections in this space. Um, so that's a great suggestion by Nicola. And maybe we can reach out to the organizers and see if that's possible. I, I I think that's a great idea. There, there's so many big number uses of composites and materials for other things and whether that's sports and just like that thought of that we have to have new composites for whether it's snowboards or, mm -hmm. or surfboards. Uh, I approached a uh, sailing racing foundation about trying to do the same thing and I got some great engineering advice and some great support to be able to design a new or faster moving coral tank from the inside of the port moving of the coral instead of the racing side on the outside of a hull. As well, some good suggestions for, for more uh, organic materials and some great ice suggestions for end of life recycling. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's always one thing to keep in mind too. If this, it's a durable material like Dave is using. Um, we still have to think of the end of life eventually. Um, even if he doesn't need it or want it to be biodegradable on short time scales. So we always have to think of the whole circle, right? Um, circularity. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, I need to roll out here in about a minute, but this has been a fantastic discussion. Um, really great food for thought. And I hope we can keep the conversation going offline. Mike mm -hmm. is collecting anyone who wants to participate in this um, newfound, you know, organization committee um, to kind of tackle this problem. So thank you everyone for joining us today and participating um, and reach out to any of us here on the panel if you'd like to chat further. Thank you, Sydney, thank you. for joining us. Great, Sydney. Looking forward to hearing from you. Great, thanks. It was great Alrighty. to meet everyone and hope you all have right. a great rest of the time in Sea Change and look at all the other sessions going on. All right, all right. thank you. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, Ken. Great. See y'all. See you, Dave. Bye, everyone. Bye.